This episode is brought to you in association with Janice Henderson Investors. It's for promotional purposes only, is not for forward distribution, and the value of an investment can fall as well as rise. Past performance is not a guide to future performance, and nothing in this episode should be construed as advice. Our discussion is for illustrative purposes only, and references made to individual securities should not constitute or form part of any offer or solicitation to issue, sell, subscribe, or purchase the security. Hello, and welcome to Trust Radio, the investment trust podcast hosted by Janice Henderson Investors, where we take a deep dive into the questions investors really want to know the answers to. My name is Andrew Chaguri, and today I'm joined by Mike Curley. Today we'll be discussing factors currently affecting the Asian market, notably the regulatory crampdown in China, the divergence in performance between North and Southeast Asian countries, and how he's navigating these challenges. Mike. Though the global economy bounced back in 2021, Asia markets continue to struggle due to recurring COVID-19 waves, ongoing lockdown restrictions. However, as 2022 gets underway, slowing growth in China, coupled with risks of high inflation and stagnating growth, could dampen the outlook for the region. This has got some investors asking, is the Asian dream still alive? It's, it's a very difficult question to answer, to be honest, because yes, the Asian dream is still alive. But there's so many other things going on at the moment, whether it's Russia and Ukraine or where we are in the US rate cycle, etc. These big things are dominating market movement. But from our perspective and just looking at the underlying trends, nothing's really changed. However, market movements are being a little distracting, if you like. The fundamentals still remain. Asian companies are well positioned. They are well capitalized and they have ongoing growth opportunities, which will remain for many years to come. So yes, the Asian dream is still alive, but it's a, it's a murky picture. Looking at the, you know, the region's growth engine, which is China, you know, one of the key highlights last year was the regulatory clampdown. That was to solve some of the structural problems that have developed over time. You know, this has led some investors to say China is uninvestable. However, this is sentiment you, you know, clearly disagree with. Where are you currently finding opportunities in China? And have they been any particular sectors or businesses that have come out as winners because of that clampdown? Yeah, just going back to the, the, the history of why China did these measures when it did. I mean, it took the opportunity, I think, to, to use the strength in GDP, which we saw in 2021 and coming off a very low base in 2020, to make some fundamental long-term changes to the economy to address wealth disparity and some abusive practices from corporates. But I think that's probably pretty much come to an end now. I think it's obvious that China is now focused on growth rather than regulatory issues uh, because the economy is slowing and has been slowing for some time. And with the zero COVID policy, et cetera, and economic lockdowns, there is a worry about growth in China, now more so than there is about regulatory change. So the opportunities for us, well, it's, it's basically to make sure we invest alongside the government, not against it. In the five-year plans that have been announced, it's pretty obvious what the focus is is for the government, and it's around uh, self-sufficiency, but they still want to encourage innovation in various different sectors with this whole theme of common prosperity to make sure that you know companies do their bit, not only for their workers, um, but also for, for the general population. As long as we bear that in mind, then there's still plenty of opportunities. You touched on the growth aspect there, but uh, you know some would say that that clampdown might actually impact China's long-term growth. What, what is your thought on that? I think it's more likely to impact their short-term growth than it is the long-term growth because I think you know addressing wealth disparity is, is admirable. Whether we agree with how they've done it or not is another point, but I think the goal is admirable. And common prosperity as well, um, again, an admirable goal. These are going to have short-term impacts, but I would probably argue that the longer-term Maybe it doesn't improve the quantity of growth, but it probably improves the quality of growth. And that's always been our problem with China, is that the, the quantity has never been the problem, it's just the quality. And I think some of these changes actually may address that. You briefly mentioned before that you know, growth in, in China is slowing a little bit. You know, coupled that with higher inflation, you know, it poses the question, is China headed towards stagflation? I don't think so. Um, I think in China specifically, um, we haven't actually seen a significant impact on inflation, similar to the rest of the world. Inflation in, in, in China is much lower than it is uh, here in the UK or the US or Europe. 
And that's partly because the lockdowns have actually uh, reduced the demand to a degree, which has kind of put a cap on, on, on the levels of um, inflation, despite the fact that raw material prices, etc., have risen. I think stagflation itself is probably more of an issue for the rest of the world than it is for, for China specifically. We may well be entering a period where interest rates are going up because I think the Fed is pretty much behind the curve, as we're well aware. Infl uh, interest rate will go, it will go up, probably not as much as inflation, and that could have a serious impact on demand uh, going forward. So I think stagflation is probably more of an issue for the rest of the world than it is for China. Looking at the trust more specifically, you know, it's been a great uh, trust for those investors seeking income currently with, you know, uh, generating an 8% yield. However, uh, the capital growth element um, has lagged behind. Um, more of a two-part question. Can Asian countries continue to provide such a high income given the current market backdrop? Well, I think the income is probably the safest thing we, we, we've got in Asia at the moment. You know, we're seeing a lot of volatility in prices, but not a lot of volatility in earnings, cash flow or dividends. So, you know, we're pretty upbeat. We've had two years, really, of pretty negligible dividend growth in Asia for obvious reasons. The whole world's seen the same thing. But I think we revert in the next few years back to where we should be, which is to see dividends grow at least in line with earnings, probably more. The forecast for earnings growth for this year is 10%. I, I'm perfectly confident that we will see you know, double-digit dividend growth under that scenario. And if we get some more stability, then we retain that, that dividend growth. As I say, capital companies in Asia are very well capitalized. Lots of cash on balance sheets, don't pay out as much dividends as they should and, and could do. And I expect that to change in the years ahead. Okay. Um, you know, while that outlook for income looks solid, investors are also look, looking at that capital growth. Are you doing anything to address that element of the portfolio? What we focus on with the stocks we look at is cash flow generation. Cash flow is what pay div pays dividends, and clearly there is a focus in, in this trust on, on dividends. So, you know, we try and align that with the companies we look at. We look for companies that generate uh, strong cash flow, growing cash flow, and hence growing dividends. The problem is in the last couple of years, no one's really cared about cash flow. With, you know, real rates in negative territory, cash has been almost devalued. So. It's been devalued not only by investors, but it's been devalued by, as an investment tool or a valuation tool. So the stocks we've owned, which have generate, continued to generate cash flow, continue to generate dividends, really have been cast aside in favor of some thematics around internet, e-commerce, electric vehicles, all, all the things that don't actually generate much cash flow or income or dividends. So we've been through this period where, you know, it's not, the high yield necessarily which has impacted our capital performance it's more about the style yield has been out of favor in this environment but i think as we've seen actually in the first three months of this year that yield is coming back into favor people are thinking to themselves where can i now invest you know negative real interest rates suggesting that cash doesn't work a bit more volatility in equity markets certainly a bit more volatility in bond markets House prices have gone up a lot, et cetera, et cetera. You know, where do you start getting income now from your investments? And I, I think that that favors this kind of strategy going forward. Picking up from where, you know, uncertainty about where to invest. One of the themes that we've seen a fallout from COVID-19 has been the divergence of growth and recovery. And we've seen North Asian countries outperforming those in the South. And the current picture with high inflation, soaring energy prices and kind of stagnant wage growth that could exacerbate that problem in some of those countries. How are you navigating this regional divergence in performance? Well, we've, we've favoured North Asia over South Asia for, for most of the COVID period on the basis that uh, the South, South Asia and ASEAN in particular you know, is, has been very dependent on tourism uh, and foreign capital, which has kind of dried up in the last two years. Plus, these are the economies that tend to be most susceptible to to rising commodity and energy prices make, tends to make their currencies quite volatile, also inflation volatile and interest rates volatile. So generally, you know, these countries haven't been favoured in the last two years. And North Asia, on the other hand, tends to be the manufacturing hub, especially the technology sector. And technology, as we know, has been in favour as people have been, you know, working from home, buying more laptops and e-commerce and semiconductors and you know, ways in which uh, the world is now driving uh, enterprise. 
So the, North Asia has been a beneficiary of that, whereas South Asia tends to be more manufacturing of lower value added goods and tourism. So you can see why one is not done quite so well as the other. I mean, you touched on energy and commodity and exporting there. I mean, some of those countries uh, in Asia have performed well in recent months. Are there any other sectors or companies that are thriving in this higher energy and commodity price environment? Well, the main beneficiaries clearly are the producers, the miners. And as you go further down the chain, if you like, the supply chain, then there's varying degrees of cross, uh, cost pressures through that chain. And it's all about the ability of companies to be able to pass on those rising costs. Some can, some can't. And, you know, depending on the brand, you know, your brand can, can maintain margins. But if you're in a highly competitive market, then generally you're going to see margin contraction as, as, as costs rise. So, you know, our strategy has been is to, you know, to be at the, the forefront, if you like, the coalface, literally. We prefer the, the companies that mine, whether it's copper, iron ore, lithium, etc. These kind of products, which actually kind of are fueling not only the demand for normal fossilized fuels, but also for, for new energy demand, copper in particular. Just coming back to, to the coal face on there, I mean, I think there's another side of that conversation. And more recently, we've seen a push towards decarbonization and cleaner energy sources. However, Southeast Asia currently, you know, has 80% of its energy coming from fossil fuels. Therefore, if it's to decarbonize, you know, this might have a huge impact on not only its growth, but also a big impact on climate change as a whole. Can Southeast Asia maintain its high growth without the, the carbon baggage, so to speak? Well, uh, you know, to be honest, all, all economies globally have far too much of their energy generation from, from fossil fuel. Even the ones that are the most advanced have still got some way to go to get to, to carbon neutrality, etc. I mean, I think what we've seen in the energy sector, especially with what's happened with Russia and Ukraine and this disruption in, in, in oil and gas supplies, in particular to Europe, but obviously globally, is there's, there's currently a bit more of a focus on energy security than there is on this transition to, to green energy. And although that's a shame, to be honest, um, what it has brought to the fore is the fact that we can't get from dependency on fossil fuels to dependency on green energy overnight. And that, I think, is it, it has been brought to bear by what's happened in the last two to three months. So I would see, say for the whole world, but you know, Asia, and as you mentioned, South Asia in particular, we're going to see this transition. But I'd hope going forward, we're going to see a much better planned out transition than what has been talked about so far. We have to move from fossil fuels to something greener, but there needs to be a plan to do it. and maybe queuing outside banks saying that banks can't lend to miners is probably not the way forward. We need to be able to work with these companies, whether they're the miners or the financiers, in order to reduce their carbon footprint over time, in order that we don't get the massive disruptions and the spike in prices that we've seen already. That, that's a, a global as well as a regional comment. Right. I mean, you know, as that transition happens, you know, are you finding any opportunities in Asia, you know, some businesses that might help, you know, help that transition towards a more green or more sustainable economy. Are you finding some of those opportunities within that region? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mentioned copper earlier. Copper, you know, traditionally has been um, associated with global cycles, and you know, copper tends to go up when economic growth is strong because it's, it's usage in housing and um, various other factors. But now, all of a sudden, things like copper, aluminium, lithium, nickel. Cobalt. These have now got new uses, whether it's in uh, batteries for electric vehicles or whether it's in uh, um, the backbone for electrification and new energy electrification. So there are opportunities, definitely. But you know, we also look at gas um, because gas we consider to be a transition fuel. Yes, it's a fossil fuel. No, it's not great for the environment, but it's better than coal and oil. So. We think, you know, the argument for looking at gas companies and gas producers is a very strong one as people move away from coal, move away from oil fired towards gas as we transition, as I say, to a more uh, a cleaner producing environment. OK, interesting. I mean, you've got a lot of exposure to companies that will help that that transition towards a more sustainable, greener economy. But broadly, at a company level, how do you interact with companies and how they approach their business from an ESG perspective? 
we do have a lot of exposure to materials and energy. And I, I mentioned to you before about being pragmatic about this move towards uh, more environment-friendly um, investing. But as I said before, you know, there is a transition. There is a, a period of change. And the way we look at it is we want to engage with companies in order to help them make that change. So we don't say we're not going to invest in certain in just industries. If these industries are essential, which they are at this point, they may not be in the future, but they are now. We want to work with the companies to say, well, look, you know, what are your targets? What, what, are, you, what are you setting out? And we want to see a clear plan on how you're going to achieve this. And then hold them to task when they don't. Personally, I think that's much more, has a much more positive impact on, on change than stepping back and saying, I'm not going to invest in that and leave it to somebody else. Interesting. So inclusion rather than exclusion as an approach. However, some would argue that if you invest in China, that kind of dampens your approach to ESG or doesn't really give you any credibility from an ESG perspective. What do you think about that? I think it's important to know with China that you invest in China with your eyes wide open and with you know, all your boxes ticked in knowing in, in what the constraints are and what, against what the opportunities are. From an ESG perspective, you know, taking E, you know, clearly China's made some environmental goals that it wants to achieve over the longer term. I think they're going to be put slightly on the back burner as they have everywhere else at the moment because of energy security over energy transition. But they have made goals towards, you know, being less polluters and, and, you know, Xi Jinping has made it pretty clear um, that you know one of the biggest complaints of the people is is pollution. So, and considering you know the Communist Party is there because not, obviously it's not democratic, but obviously you know what the Communist Party is trying to achieve is continuity, and you know they will try to address concerns of the people over time. The social element, well, clearly, you know, workers' rights and this, that, and the other. We've seen lots of complaints around that. Uh, clearly, what's happening in Xinjiang is, is, is with the Ouija's is, is, is pretty terrible and slave labor, etc. But there's a lot more work now on, on minimum wage and, and the protection of labor in manufacturing than there ever has been in the past. More work to do, but again, you know, there is transition or uh, an improvement. And the, and the G, well, the governance bit is has always been there, nothing's changed. The state owns large swathes of the economy and the state doesn't necessarily have the same goals as the as a shareholder. As long as you realize that and invest alongside what the government's trying to achieve, to me, you know, there is still opportunity. It's not something you put a, uh, a red cross against and just go somewhere else. There are constraints. Understanding what the government's trying to achieve is, is paramount. So the important thing with the question with is China investable from an ESG standpoint? It is, but there are constraints. There are things you need to be aware of and you need to invest accordingly. Perfect. All right. Thanks for joining, Mike. Thanks. Man. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with anyone you think will also find this interesting. If you want to learn more about investment trusts, we have a wealth of information available on our website, which you can find in the show notes. Important information, not for onward distribution. Before investing in an investment trust referred to in this podcast, you should satisfy yourself as to its suitability and the risks involved. You may wish to consult a financial advisor. This is a marketing communication. Please refer to the AIFMD disclosure document and the annual reports of the AIF before making any final investment decisions. Past performance does not predict future returns. The value of an investment and the income from it can fall as well as rise, and you may not get back the amount you originally invested. Tax assumptions and reliefs depend upon an investor's particular circumstances and may change if those circumstances or the law change. Nothing in this podcast is intended to or should be construed as advice. This podcast is not a recommendation to sell or purchase any investment. It does not form part of any contract for the sale or purchase of any investment. We may record telephone calls for our mutual protection 
to improve customer service and for the regulatory record keeping purposes. Issued in the UK by Janus Sanderson Investors. Janus Sanderson Investors is the name under which investment products and services are provided by Janus Sanderson Investors International Limited. Reg number 3594615. Janus Sanderson Investors UK Limited. Reg number 906355. Janus Sanderson Fund Management UK Limited. Reg number 267853. Henderson Equity Partners Limited, reg number 2606646, six, each registered in England and Wales at 201 Bishopsgate in London, EC2M 3AE, and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. And Henderson Management S.A, reg number B22848 at 2 Route de Bitborg, L1273 Luxembourg and regulated by the Commission du Surveillance du Secteur Financier. Janus Sanderson, Knowledge Shared and Knowledge Labs are trademarks of Janus Sanderson Group PLC or one of its subsidiaries. Copyright, Janus Sanderson Group PLC. Henderson Far East Income Limited is a Jersey fund registered at Liberty 1923 Lamont Street, St. Helier, Jersey, JE2 4SY and is regulated by the Jersey Financial Services Commission.